let's then uh, talk about treatment options, right? That if you're going to embark on treatment, and I think the agree, everyone agrees that the goal really should be complete obliteration of AVMs. There are certainly some exceptions in the literature about partially treated AVMs um, and how they may be utilized in certain situations for intractable, uh, you know, otherwise not non-operative or, or non-radiosurgical uh, AVMs. But those are few and far between. In general, our goal really should be complete obliteration of the AVM if we're going to undertake treatment. So the options that I want to briefly talk through are the idea of observation, microsurgery, stereotactic radiosurgery, and endovascular. Right, endovascular used as an adjunct and an endovascular used for cu for cure. And obviously, with observation, we're going to talk about the Aruba trial. Uh, for microsurgery, we're going to talk about the idea of actually removing the entire nidus and and briefly just what strategies are the larger principles in reviewing the nidus, removing the nidus. Stereotactic radiosurgery principles uh, we'll talk about briefly. And then endovascular uh, in the US comes in, in two different flavors in terms of um, agents that are used, but now there's also a broadening role of transarterial and transvenous embolization. All right, so, you know, turning then first to microsurgery, uh, this is a, a young patient with a superficial uh, right uh, uh, occipital AVM that was taken for surgical resection. And, you know, the general principles of surgical resection are opening wider than you generally would uh, expect for other lesions such as tumors, for example. You really wanna have an, uh, a clear assessment. And you can see this in the lower left-hand uh, uh, plate mark D. That you wanna be able to see all your relevant structures, your midline, your entire AVM nidus, uh, this is your draining vein as well and all adjacent cortex. Um, this is not one of those lesions where you want to be working underneath the bone or working a little bit in a dark corridor, having a, a clear visualization of the entire cube. And I, I suspect when Dr. Lawton lectured last week, he, I'm sure he shared with you some of the pearls from his fantastic book and the idea of looking at these AVMs as a six-sided cube in most situations. And so you know, plate E, you're sort of systematically working your way around that cube, uh, starting with each of the, you obviously have the uh, one side exposed, uh, but you wanna do the other four sides in a way that is systematic all around. And then the larger, the last and most difficult challenging part of that cube is that deep face uh, that you're removing where many of the feeders might be coming from. But at the end, you, what you really wanna see is normal brain all around, uh, and making sure that your superficial draining vein, which here is here in F, has now um, is now no longer arterialized. So you can see if you compare D and F, you've gone from a reddish arterialized vein to a more purplish normal colored vein, right? And that's a, a sign that all of your inflow has diminished. So where I think most of us find microsurgery particularly effective is that it provides provides immediate risk reduction of the AVM. In general, um, in adults, you know, once that AVM is out, the risk of recurrence of these lesions, once you've angiographically demonstrated cure, is extraordinarily low. That's slightly different in the pediatric population. So kids definitely need some delayed imaging uh, after successful AVM resection. But in general, Spetzel Martin grade one and two AVMs are the best candidates. And these can be performed with or without adjunctive embolization. So I've included just two studies here just to point out that, you know, obviously microsurgery, you need to understand what the potential risks are. So the things you obviously worry about as with any vascular procedure is, or any cranial procedure is the risk of stroke and death. And it's low, but it's certainly not uh, negligible. And these are uh, numbers that you definitely need to communicate with patients as you're counseling them. So in general, you know, the, the complication rate for Spetzelmartin grade one and two is quite low. Uh, a follow-up study by Dr. Spetzler and others really then subcategorizing the Spetzelmartin grade and their broader experience of you know, nearly 2,000 patients, you can see that Spetzelmartin grade one AVMs have a, uh, a risk, a surgical risk of around 
And once you get to two, it's around 10%. And as you get further up, you know, those risks get higher and higher. Uh, and Spencer Martin grade four and five AVMs have a very meaningful complication rate, even in the most experienced of hands. All right, so turning then to stereotactic radiosurgery, uh, where I think most of us find this particularly effective is for eloquent or deep-seated AVMs or in frail patients with ruptured lesions. But the idea here is uh, similar regardless of which of the two uh, general systems you're using. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the idea of either gamma knife or linear accelerator uh, or LINAC. But regardless of the medium, whether it's cobalt or uh, accelerated electrons, uh, the, uh, the principle is the exact same, is that you're using a arc-based system with multiple inputs of targeted radiation that reduce radiation dose throughout the entire brain, but focus your radiation dose in a very narrow focal segment uh, at the AVM. And so, you know, the advantages here clearly are that this is an outpatient procedure. Uh, you know, patients tend to tolerate this quite well but it's not risk-free. There certainly are concerns about edema, uh, radiation necrosis, and sometimes even uh, post-radiation seizures. And overall, the literature suggests that these are really best for small and moderate size AVMs. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that these have a latency period. So the idea is that if you do radius surgery today, it really takes anywhere from one to three years for the radiation to thrombose the entire AVM. So during that time, there definitely is a period of risk that the patient needs to understand. And in general, you know, for what I counsel patients is that you need to estimate there probably is a roughly, you know, two to 4% risk, depending on your risk factors for the next year or two while the radiation works. And the dose typically is 15 to 25 gray. And this is what a typical radiosurgery map will look like mapping out radiation doses to the AVM itself, as well as to any critical structures in the brain surrounding it. So when you look at you know, these more recent studies, there are sort of larger uh, reviews of AVM obliteration rates and unruptured aneurysms. You can see that the rates of obliteration for all comers is somewhere between 60 and the high 70% rate. And that there is a small, but not zero, risk of uh, rupture in that uh, period of latency. So this is a nice example of a AVM that underwent radiosurgery. Um, and this is just a follow-up angiogram done that you can see that after three years has been complete obliteration of what was actually a, a reasonably sizable AVM. So, you know, turning then to embolization, and so embolization is typically performed with either NBCA or glue. And I think that the specifics of these two agents I, you know, are gonna be outside of what I'm gonna talk about today. And I suspect that you've had others speak about both of these. But the idea is that these are liquid embolics that typically we're injecting into the arterial feeders of the AVM while we're simultaneously preserving feeders to normal brain. And uh, especially with onyx, we tend to work on getting as much penetration of that liquid embolic into the nidus itself. Um, the advantages of penetration are that perhaps through a single transarterial injection, sometimes we can actually close off uh, other arterial inflows uh, as well if it's done effectively um, and uh, uh, appropriately. And obviously, when you're doing these transarterial, you wanna make sure that you don't get liquid embolic into these veins, uh, because as you guys uh, know, you can't close off these veins before you close off the arterial inflow when you're using a transarterial route. Now, in general, each of these stages carries anywhere between a one to 5% risk per stage. Um, and so, you know, glue in general tends to have a slightly lower per procedure complication risk than onyx but Onyx utilizes less procedures for a given AVM. So you, you can already see that even when we're talking about embolization, there's just a lot of heterogeneity, even in deciding uh, what the best embolic agent might be. Now, there is 
as we've gotten better and better with transarterial embolization, there is a push for moving towards trying to cure uh, more and more of these AVM lesions. Uh, and so, you know, firstly, this is just what embolization looks like. This is a before and after embolization, and you can hopefully appreciate the shadow of embolic material posteriorly here. And this is residual AVM that you can then either go on to either resect uh, or less commonly now radiosurgery after embolization. So, you know, Dr. Lopez and others, and this is a, a nice study of his from 2016, have worked on, you know, similar to identifying risk features that Spencer Martin did for surgical treatment. Um, this uh, uh, AVM EmboCure score looks at identifying embospecific features. So size certainly still plays a role. The number of arterial pedicles plays a role, the number of draining veins, um, and then vascular eloquence as well. So some overlap certainly to Spetzler Martin, uh, but some differences specific for endovascular. And this is just you know one of the endpoints that they looked at, and this was the idea of complete obliteration. And you can see as the at AVM EmboCure score goes up, from three to five, your rates of hundred of total cure. So that's that purp, uh, light purplish bar uh, or lighter purplish bar uh, go from hundred percent down to twenty percent, and your rate of complication rises quite rapidly. Uh, and so this clearly shows that there is a subgroup of AVMs that's quite amenable to uh, cure, uh, but uh, they're also uh, are others that are, are not appropriate for it. Now, increasingly, there is a push for uh, transvenous embolization uh, and a as a strategy for cure. I won't go in that, into that too much today, and you know, because it's a very evolving, rapidly evolving body of literature. Uh, this is actually a recent journal of neurosurgery systematic review of looking at a variety of studies, 15 studies with almost 600 patients with an intent to cure uh, as the endpoint. And the only thing I wanna point out um, to this group is that the overall cl clinical complication rate was 24% uh, in this analysis. So obviously there's quite a few subgroups within this um, that are outside of the scope of what I have time to discuss today. But I think hopefully you can take away the message that the idea of embolization cure um, is extremely complex and certainly not all AVMs are meant for just a uh, single therapy cure. <clears throat> and then, you know, I wanna talk obviously about the idea of observation and observation goes back to the concepts that we were talking about at the very beginning. And this is the idea of reliance on the natural history, uh, that the risk of treatment may exceed the risk of the natural history in certain situations. And so typically I think we would think of observation um, being, or that ratio being uh, favoring the idea of observation in older or more frail patients, uh, AVMs located in highly eloquent or deep locations, and then certainly the higher grade uh, AVMs. And I know you guys have reviewed in some detail the Aruba study so I won't dwell on the nitty gritty of the trial, but you know, as you know, that it's really the only randomized trial that we have to date that looks at observation versus treatment of unruptured brain AVMs. And you know, they looked at a little bit over 220 patients in two groups, either those that were observed or those that underwent treatment, keeping in mind that treatment was a combined strategy of surgery, SRS, and embolization. Uh, there, there wasn't subgroup analysis in the original Aruba data based on those individual uh, treatment strategies. Uh, and then the interim analysis was done at a mean of 33 months where they looked at stroke uh, or death as the primary endpoint. Uh, and what they immediately found at that interim analysis was obviously that the treatment group was almost three times higher when you looked at the uh, stroke and death. Now, stroke wasn't just ischemic stroke, uh, anything that um, uh, there, there were multiple other complications that were then kind of bundled into that endpoint. So, uh, you know, this 2019 uh, criticism of Aruba 
I think just really summarizes some points of discussions well, and that's why I've included it here. So, you know, this basically breaks some of the study flaws into issues with design, um, study progression, and then analysis and conclusion. So I, I know you, you guys are probably quite familiar with this, but I, I thought it would be nice to at least show this all in one place. So some of the des design challenges that uh, many of us have complained about is the idea of combining microsurgery, radiosurgery, and embolization all into a intervention arm. You know, hopefully this last month has shown you that each of these three strategies clearly has many subgroup um, considerations within them. Uh, clearly the risks of each of these, depending on what scenario you use them for is quite different. And clearly uh, these strategies can actually have been used in some combination, right? So the other big study issue was what I'd mentioned earlier, and that is this inclusive definition of stroke or this overly inclusive definition of stroke, uh, that many things that were not necessarily stroke in terms of a complication uh, were included into that stroke bundle, leading to uh, a meaningful overestimation of stroke risk per se from the interventional arm. And then if you look at study progression, uh, the recruitment itself was extraordinarily slow. Uh, and part of that was that you know, many of the centers where this trial took place, you know, had challenges actually placing patients into the trial for the following reasons. That, you know, a high number of eligible patients were not randomized uh, in the original intent or the way that the original um, uh, creators of the trial intended. And this led to a very early selection bias. There were an oddly small percentage of low-grade AVMs that were treated with microsurgery uh, that made you know many of us in the cerebrovascular neurosurgical community question whether this was really representative of the kinds and numbers of patients that we were seeing in our offices uh, and the discussions that we were having with our patients and the way that many of these patients we know are getting treated at May centers across the US and Europe. And then the other shortfall obviously is that 33 month um, analysis uh, period that was obviously an interim analysis, but you know, as I've shared with you, when we talk about AVMs, we really are kind of talking about this idea of lifetime risk of hemorrhage. Uh, and so 33 months clearly is well short of any meaningful uh, longer term risk of hemorrhage uh, for an untreated, unruptured AVM. And then lastly, this uh, challenges with analysis that, you know, the, there wasn't really any meaningful subgroup analysis evaluating different outcomes of different treatment modalities. And so I think misleadingly, there was a conclusion early on of the superiority of medical management. So, you know, with that, I, I think the flip side is also very important for all of us to take away that every trial, whether it's negative or a trial that we uh, potentially disagree with some of the conclusions, you know, there are, I think, three very important takeaway points that all of us learned from Maruba that were extremely helpful in, in how we approach patients. So Aruba did confirm for us what I think a lot of our pooled analysis also showed is that in general, the natural history shows that the rupture risk is approximately 2% per year. Uh, Aruba confirmed for us that clearly a low complication rate with any intervention is key to a genuine patient benefit, right? And I think this point cannot be overstated that as a practitioner, um, all of us need to be very honest with ourselves in terms of what are the treatment strategies we're most comfortable with. Uh, since we're the ones treating that particular patient, you know, the idea of, you know, in my hands, this is the complication risk with surgery or endovascular or radiosurgery. And you have to approach your patients with your numbers, your low numbers, but your numbers in mind as well. And keeping those complication rates low is very important as you look at that natural history uh, versus treatment risk benefit ratio. And that observation clearly cannot be discounted as a strategy. There are uh, many patients that fall into this observation group uh, that we talked about, uh, eloquent patients, deep AVMs, um, elderly and frail patients, where their life expectancy or the treatment complication risk just may not rationalize uh, undergoing anything more aggressive. 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.